Today I want to speak to you on the subject of what is Russia's role in final Bible prophecy. What is Russia's role in final Bible prophecy? And uh, in today's study, I'm going to do my best to answer three principal questions that I believe are significant and very vitally important to any genuine student of the Bible, and especially to those of you who are students of Bible prophecy and study with us. And the three questions that I'm going to answer today is, number one, where do we find Russia in the Bible? Uh, it's very important if you're a student of the Bible and Bible prophecy that when people ask you about Russia, that you're able to open your Bible, show them in the Bible where Russia is found, and identify that properly. The second question is, what is Gog and Magog? And you're going to find in our study today, we're going to address two passages, because there are two distinct Gog and Magog battles in the Bible. They are not the same. Two distinct Gog and Magog battles, and so I'm going to carefully answer that question, who is Gog and Magog? And then the third question that I want to answer in this study is because the Bible clearly identifies a Russian coalition army invading Israel in Bible prophecy, the third question we need to address is when will Russia and this coalition army invade Israel? What is the timing of that according to Bible prophecy? And so if you have your Bible open with me to Ezekiel and the 38th chapter, Ezekiel chapter 38, and we're going to begin reading at verse 1, and we're going to read down through verse 39. And as you're turning in the Bible, in recent Lost Lamb outreaches, and when I say recent, within days, I had been asked to speak on Russia in Bible prophecy and to preach on Gog and Magog. I want you to know that we are editing those messages and they will be added to our YouTube and our Facebook and our podcast channel uh, in the days ahead. And I mention that to you because there will be uh, things that I'll cover in those messages that I'll not cover here, but I will at least lay down a foundation in this teaching. I hope that you'll listen to this teaching first, and then if you have an opportunity, join us in those live services that will be edited and added for content in the days ahead on YouTube, on Facebook, and on our podcast channel. And by the way, if you don't already subscribe to our channels, they're all free. I've put no fee, no subscription on any of our content. We're making all of this content available to you because we want you to be serious students of the Bible. And as you have heard me say before, if you've been a student of mine for any length of time, it is impossible to be a serious student of the Bible and not be a serious student of Bible prophecy because Bible prophecy, you'll oftentimes hear, is one-third of the Bible. Well, that's a little generous. It probably is closer to about 28%. But about 28% of your Bible is prophetic in content, and it is impossible to be a serious student of the Bible and not be a serious student of Bible prophecy. Ezekiel chapter 38, beginning to read at verse 1, and we're going to read down through verse 9. And today, I thought for a change of pace, I would read to you out of the New American Standard Bible, the NASB. And as always, I never bring uh, an academic uh, flop of translation before your eyes. I always am careful that we're bringing you good translations of the Bible, and for all of you who 
ask and we get a lot of questions, which translation of the Bible is the most accurate? There's an entire YouTube teaching on that. At some point, I would suggest that you listen to that because one of the common questions we get in continuously is what version of the Bible should I buy? Or I just received Christ watching your programs. I don't own a Bible. I want to buy one. What do you recommend? And so in that teaching, I recommend five Bibles to, uh, to consider adding to your library. And I also mention several that you should not buy because they are not full academic translations. The NASB, New American Standard Bible, is an excellent Bible if you're looking for one. Ezekiel 38, uh, beginning to read at verse 1, And the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, set your face toward Gog of the land of Magog, the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal, and prophesy against him, and say, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, O Gog, prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal. I will turn you about and put hooks into your jaws, and I will bring you out and all your army, horses and horsemen, all of them splendidly attired, a great company with buckler and shield, all of them wielding swords, Persia, Ethiopia, and put with them, all of them with shield and helmet, Gomer with all its troops, Beth Targarma from the remote parts of the north with all its troops, many peoples with you. Pause right there. In this prophecy, Ezekiel is prophesying about a coalition army in the last days that is going to invade Israel. I'll come back to that and give you detail. Verse 7, Be prepared and prepare yourself, you and all your companies that are assembled about you, and be a guard for them. After many days you will be summoned. In the latter years, you will come into the land that is restored from the sword, whose inhabitants have been gathered from many nations to the mountains of Israel, which had been a continual waste. But its people were brought out from the nations, and they are living securely, all of them. You will go up, you will come like a storm, you will be like a cloud covering the land, you and all your troops and many peoples with you. As always, before we get into this Bible study, let's take a moment to pray together. Father, once again, uh, we thank you for another opportunity to open the Bible and to learn. We ask that the Holy Spirit would guide us into your purposeful and prophetic truth. We know that we're living in the final moments of human history, and my prayer is that all of the thousands of people who will listen to this in the days and weeks ahead would be ready to meet the Lord in the last days. And I pray if they're not ready to meet the Lord that you'll help me to build the bridge of the gospel from where they're at to where you've called them to be. Help someone today. Encourage someone today to know that no matter what the past, no matter what their sin, no matter how they have fallen short of your glory, that the grace of God is available to all who call upon your name. And I pray that men and women and boys and girls would come to know Jesus Christ through our time together as their personal Lord and Savior, and that in these final and perilous times in which we live, that they would be motivated by the content of the Bible to live ready to meet the Lord every day. 
And for these things we ask, and we ask in the name of Jesus. And all God's people said, Amen. I want to say something as we begin. I am very much aware of the fact, maybe even overly sensitive to the fact, that in modern church history, every time Russia sneezes, the internet lights up with social media videos and foolish talking heads making sensational claims, uh, twisting Bible prophecy that they're not students of, trying to fit their own personal narratives or their own personal words or their own personal prophecies, and it, in any way, shape, and form, it corrupts the author's original intent. So I want to tell you that I promise you we're not going to do this today. I have been a student of and have preached on Bible prophecy for going on five decades, and I take it very seriously. If there's anything that disgusts me, it is those who do not know Bible prophecy but see a headline in a modern paper or hear a news story that's come to their digital device and for the sake of views and clicks and followers, they put together uh, an attempt at teaching Bible prophecy that more often is more personal commentary than it is what the Bible actually says. And so I promise you that we're not going to do that today. And I also pledge to you, if you're a new student of ours, that I never want to be guilty of producing content and providing content for you that is not accurate and academic. I never forget that when I open up this Bible, that one day I personally am going to stand before God and give an account for how I handled sacred truth. So this teaching on Russia is not social media clickbait. This is going to be a careful systematic study of what the Bible said, and in particular, what the prophet Ezekiel said in chapters 38 and 39. Uh, I humbly pledge to you that I uh, am doing my absolute best. I sincerely desire to be a trusted voice in your life in these last days for understanding the Bible and end-time prophecy and so I hope that in the eyes of God you'll know my heart and I hope you'll know that I in no way, shape, or form want to be a part of the foolishness that often is found in the internet. With that said, yesterday I was reading the Jerusalem Post uh, online and what caused me to turn to this famous publication out of Israel is that the headline of the paper was, Has Biblical Gog and Magog War Begun? These are Jewish people representing Israel, most of them not believers, not followers of Christ, but obviously God's chosen people. And one of the main media outlets, one of their main papers and publications both in print and digital, is the Jerusalem Post. And the headline yesterday, Has Biblical Gog and Magog War Begun? Listen very carefully to what I'm about to say, because oftentimes I have people that would say, well, if there was just something in the Bible that I could prove, it would help my faith. I had a mother that recently wrote and said, I have a son and he keeps telling me, well, the Bible says that there are things that are predicted, but there's no specific prophecies in the Bible that you can point out to me. And sadly, that mother is a brand new Christian, and she wants to point out things in the Bible that are fulfilled and are definitive for uh, her doubting son. And many of you have friends and family that doubt. Let me give you, in the infancy of this teaching, a substantial prophecy in the Bible 
that relates to how we're living right now. Did you know that the prophet Ezekiel in the Old Testament prophesied that in the last days an aggressive leader would rise up out of the nation of Russia with a desire to reassemble the Russian Empire and that upon assembling that Russian Empire that they would then take their greed for power and ally other nations in that region of the world and that they would invade Israel out of the north. That's prophesied in detail and we're going to talk a little bit about that today. Ezekiel prophesied that in the last days, many translations use the phrase, in the distant future, Ezekiel's prophecy in the 38th and 39th chapters are not prophesied for his era. Ezekiel was about 25 years old when he and his wife were taken into Babylonian captivity. At the age of 30, he became a prophet. One of his contemporaries was the prophet Daniel, who was a bit older than Ezekiel and well-known and already established as a notable, respected prophet at that time. But it was Ezekiel who prophesied that in the distant future, he made it very clear, Ezekiel 38 and 39, Ezekiel's prophecy was not for the Jewish people. It was not for those in Babylonian captivity, nor was it for that era of time. He very carefully articulated in the distant future and then gave to us details to help us know when that would be fulfilled. But Ezekiel prophesied in the last days that an aggressive leader out of Russia would arise with a greed and a lust for power, and his attempt is to bring about the reconstruction of the Russian Empire, and he'll succeed. And the Bible not only tells us that he'll succeed, but the Bible tells us that he'll not be content with bringing about the reconstruction of the Russian Empire, but will then turn his eyes towards Israel and will invade Israel out of the north along with a mighty coalition army. And we're going to get into that today. Because as I speak, the eyes of the world are currently, and when I say the eyes of the world, I mean the entire world, is watching Russia as I speak to see the details of this unfolding war. Media outlets around the globe are postulating how far is Vladimir Putin willing to go? And yesterday, as I was studying, it came on the news that they were shelling one of the nuclear plants in Ukraine. And the danger of that, most of us are aware of the horrific apocalyptic event uh, that took place in Chernobyl. And those who understand these matters better than I have said that if they attack and blow up this nuclear plant in the Ukraine, that it potentially will be six times worse than Chernobyl. This is the type of madman that we're currently dealing with. Now, listen very carefully. Do not misquote me. In this teaching... I am not saying that Vladimir Putin is Gog. He is not, I am not saying, listen, I am not saying, do not walk away from this study and say Tiff Shuttlesworth told us that Vladimir Putin is Gog in Gog and Magog in Ezekiel 38 and 39. However, potentially he could be. I'm not going to give you uh, my opinion on that because it would only be speculation. And I don't believe when you teach Bible prophecy that you should run down roads of speculation. What do we always teach you? Start in the Bible, stay in the Bible, and finish in the Bible. 
So whether or not Vladimir Putin is Gog in Ezekiel 38 and 39, I do not know. But what I do know is Ezekiel prophesied that in the last days, an aggressive Russian leader would arise with a lust to reassemble the Russian Empire and that upon assembling the Russian Empire, his lust will then turn towards the nation of Israel. He will amass a great horde of armies from that region of the world and they will descend down the Euphrates River. The Bible said that the Euphrates River would actually dry up in the last days and that these allied armies would descend out of the north down the dried up riverbed of the Euphrates to attack Israel. Well, guess which river in recent years has dried up? Now, depending upon rains and seasons, uh, there is still some flow to that. But there have been times in recent years where the Euphrates River has dried up. And that, the Bible prophesied, would become the military highway from the north down through Syria and into the north of Israel and this Gog and Magog war. The internet is currently trending with people asking, uh, and I'm getting questions from all over the world, what's going on in Russia? Does this have anything to do with Bible prophecy? And if so, how? And so that's why I'm doing this teaching today. And so if you're taking notes, be sure to write this down. Everything that we're teaching today about Russia's role in final Bible prophecy is found in Ezekiel chapter 38 and Ezekiel chapter 39. To be more specific, Ezekiel speaks specifically from Ezekiel chapter 38 and verse 1 all the way through Ezekiel chapter 39 and verse 24. Be sure to write that down. Ezekiel's Gog and Magog prophecy begins in Ezekiel 38 and verse 1 and goes into Ezekiel chapter 39 all the way through verse 24. Now, I don't have time to teach on it today, but Ezekiel 36, Ezekiel 37, Ezekiel 38, Ezekiel 39, all of that is prophetic and very detailed concerning Israel in the last days. In a thumbnail, Ezekiel 36 deals with the fact that God is going to begin to regather the children of Israel, the Jewish people, from the ends of the earth after they have been dispersed on two separate occasions. And then the Bible tells us they were driven out of the land in A.D. 70, again in A.D. 135. There they were dispersed to the ends of the earth. God said in the last days He'll regather them. That is being fulfilled. Many would say it has been fulfilled. Between America and Israel, the rest of the world combined has less than 17% of all Jews in the world. The greatest percentage of Jews in the world are currently in Israel. Uh, and that varies depending upon uh, polling, but it's about 6.8 to 7 million Jews who currently reside in Israel and about 6.3 to 6.5 million Jews reside within the area of New York City. But between New York City and Israel, the remaining Jews in the remainder of the world is less than 17%. And even what we're watching going on in the news as I speak in Ukraine, many of you have seen that the Jews in Ukraine are doing their best to flee to Israel. This is straight out of the Bible. Ezekiel 36 and 37 tells us that Israel will be regathered in stages. Ezekiel chapter 37 speaks about the dry bones and God beginning to gather them bone by bone, piece by piece, muscle by muscle. 
In other words, Ezekiel 37 is talking about a systematic regathering of the nation of Israel to their homeland. That is fulfilled as we speak. And so what happens after Ezekiel 37 and the regathering of the Jews from around the world to the homeland, which the Jews refer to that as Aliyah, returning to their homeland? Ezekiel 38. So after the regathering of Israel to their homeland, the rebuilding of their nation, May 14th, 1948, Jerusalem reestablished by the United States and allied nations recognized Jerusalem as their capital. When did that take place? May 14th, 2018, 70 years to the exact day after Israel was reborn as a nation. And then in Ezekiel 38, we move to the Gog-Magog War. Three questions I want to answer. If you're taking notes, question number one, where do we find Russia in the Bible? Many people have sent that question in to me. Uh, if, if what's going on in Russia is in Bible prophecy, where do we find Russia in the Bible? Well, I read to you out of Ezekiel chapter 38, verses 1 through 6. Look at verse 2, Ezekiel 38, verse 2. Son of man, set your face toward Gog of the land of Magog. Now, I'm going to define who Gog and Magog are. Be patient. But what I want you to highlight, the prince of Rosh, uh, some would pronounce that and say that the proper pronunciation is Rosh. Uh, I'm not going to take points off your final exam either way. The prince of Rosh, the prince of Rosh, Meshach and Tubal. Now, let me pause long enough to say there are many uh, that I've heard who are trying to teach, and uh, when I hear them say things like this, I know that they're not... Um, deep students of prophecy, but probably surface students of prophecy. But even in recent days, I've heard people say Meshach is Moscow and Tubal is Tablisk, which are two major cities in Russia. They are not. So if you hear anyone teaching that Meshach is Moscow and that Tubal is Tablisk, that is inaccurate. They are not cities in Russia it refers to different land mass masses. The Bible says, Gog of the land of Magog, the prince of Rosh, Meshach and Tubal, and prophesy against him. Highlight that. Prophesy against him. Who's him? Gog. So Gog is not a land. Gog is a leader. We'll come back to that. Prophesy against him, verse 3, and say, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, O Gog, prince of Rosh. And prince from the originals simply speaks of a person of high authority and high leadership. So Gog is a prince in Rosh. Gog is a person. Magog is a land. Write that down. Gog is a leader. Magog is a land. Gog is a leader. It speaks specifically of a man, a prince of Magog. Gog is a leader. Magog is a land. O Gog, prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal, I will turn you about and put, put hooks into your jaws and bring you out. So over 2,500 years ago, the prophet Ezekiel speaks of a group of allied nations that are going to attack Israel in the distant future. Now, none of these nations are called Russia in our modern English translations of the Bible. Uh, in other words, the word specifically, Russia, is not found in anywhere in an accurate English translation of the Bible. However, the reference to Rosh 
or Rosh in Ezekiel 38 and 2 is a shortened version of modern Russia. So let me be clear. Rosh is Russia. We don't think it is. There's not a whole lot of debate, at least among reputable scholarship. It is absolutely clear by the reference of geography that the landmass in the distant north above Israel is Russia. Now remember that Israel is the centerpiece in the Bible, both prophetically and geographically. Now that's so important. That's just a Bible prophecy golden nugget. Please write it down. Let me say it again for emphasis. When you study Bible prophecy, Israel is the centerpiece, both prophetically and geographically. So here, for example, when Ezekiel the prophet 2,500 years ago speaks about the land in the distant north, it is speaking concerning Israel being the centerpiece of the prophetic compass and the land due north. Moscow is located 1,662 miles due north of Jerusalem. There's a graphic that you'll see. And in that graphic, what I want you to see, not only is Moscow 1,662 miles due north of Jerusalem, the bearing degree on a compass from Jerusalem to Moscow is approximately only four degrees. And sometimes in reading eschatology authors and, and various papers and books and textbooks, you'll hear the statement made, Moscow is due north of Jerusalem. Well, that's pretty much accurate. Uh, there's only four degrees of difference approximately on the compass. So when you understand that Israel is the centerpiece of Bible prophecy, both prophetically and geographically, then you can identify Ezekiel's geography as well as prophecy when he refers to the landmass to the distant north. I've taught on this before, and I recently had an individual that said, uh, uh, that's a lie. You know, Syria is north of Israel. Well, I obviously understand geography. I know that Syria is on the northern border of Israel. What I am saying is the major landmass of empire power is not talking about Syria. It's talking about Rosh, which is Russia. So both the Old Testament prophets of Ezekiel and Daniel describe Israel's end-time aggressor as descending from the north. Uh, Daniel used the phrase, king of the north, to describe the commander of these allied nations in uh, Daniel chapter 11. Ezekiel's prophecy also agrees and lends support to Daniel, indicating the invading armies will come from the far north, and uh, it's always amazing. There's always, no matter what you teach, there's always somebody on the internet who has to prove uh, that their IQ is 0.7 degrees higher than yours, and uh, Syria is north. I'm, I'm speaking to you hoping that as students of the Bible that you understand that the Bible's talking about empires and ancient land masses. Russia is indeed from the far north. And I emphasize that because for those that want to start playing geography puzzles with me on the internet, first of all, I don't answer your comments. I don't answer foolishness. I only answer serious students. But the Bible specifically says far north, not the nation bordering far north. And of course, any serious student of history knows that national boundaries and national names go through changes on a regular basis. Russia, listen carefully, write it down, Russia is the only modern nation that matches Ezekiel's prophecy and his description. Hands down, no doubt about it, Rosh is Russia. Could I be any 
more clear on that point. Rosh or Rosh is indeed Russia. It is the only modern nation that matches this description. So the brief answer, if you're talking to a friend, is to say the word Russia is not found in any modern English translation, but in Ezekiel chapter 38, a nation called Rosh is, and we know that prophetically and geographically, Rosh is Russia. Question number two, who are Gog and Magog? Now listen very carefully because this is a point of confusion even in people in full-time ministry. It's amazing to me how many times I'll hear people in full-time ministry, and not rookies, people that have been in ministry for a quarter of a century or 30 or 40 or more years, confuse this either because they have not been diligent students of prophecy or because they read and assume. Because if you just read the Bible and assume that when you hear Gog and Magog anywhere in the Bible, it's the same thing. I'm not condemning it. I understand it's an easy step to be mistaken. So let me point this out to all of our students. There are two Gog-Magog wars in final Bible prophecy. Write that down. There are two distinct, different Gog and Magog wars in final Bible prophecy. The first one is what we're covering today, found in Ezekiel 38, from Ezekiel 38 verse 1 to Ezekiel 39 and verse 24. That Gog and Magog war is the first Gog-Magog war. There is a second Gog. Magog War, and that is found in Revelation chapter 20, verses 7 through 10. In Revelation chapter 7, uh, excuse me, Revelation chapter 20, verses 7 through 10, there is a second Gog Magog War. And so in your notes, be sure to have that down. There are two Gog Magog Wars. The first is found in Ezekiel 38, verse 1 through 39, verse 24. The second Gog-Magog war is found in Revelation chapter 20, verses 7 through 10. Ezekiel's Gog and Magog war in the 38th and 39th chapter takes place. Now let me be honest uh, about this, as you often hear me say. Uh, there are some various views in final Bible prophecy. Not everybody agrees on details. I always want to be humble enough to be respectful of people that may have a disagreement on the timing. But almost all substantial scholarship rests upon a very narrow window on the timing of the first Gog-Magog war in Ezekiel 38 and 39. And it varies. Some believe that it happens immediately after the rapture. Some believe that it happens closer to the halfway point during the tribulation. So there's a span there of three and a half years. So you may hear, if you study this in depth, you may come across a notable scholar who may make the argument that the battle of Gog and Magog takes place immediately after the rapture. You may find another one who will make a very valid point as to it happens after the rapture, but it happens closer to the end of the first half of the tribulation. I'm not going to be dogmatic on that because I don't believe there's enough in the Bible to drive a stake in the heart of that dogma. I, I believe that it may happen uh, in one of those two windows of time, but I do believe that it will happen, and I do believe the Bible fully supports this. It will happen after the rapture. So if you want to say that the first Gog-Magog war in Ezekiel 38, and people ask you when is that going to transpire, just be honest enough to say there are some who believe it will happen immediately after the rapture, there are some who say that it'll happen closer to the end of the first half of the tribulation. 
it's not worth having arguments on social media over because it's not essential doctrine. Now, there are a handful who believe it happens immediately before the rapture. That's not the purpose of my study. I believe I could lay out a fairly substantial biblical argument to refute that. I do not believe that it happens before the rapture. It could happen immediately after the rapture. It could happen closer to the revelation of the Antichrist, which takes place in the first half of the tribulation as far as him being promoted to a one-world leader of a one-world government with a one-world monetary system, a one-world religion, and a one-world military power. The second Gog-Magog war takes place in Revelation chapter 20, and it takes place in verses 7 through 10. Now the timing of that is at the end of the millennium. At the end of the millennium. As a matter of fact, it is the final war and judgment. The Gog-Magog war of Revelation chapter 20 is the final war and judgment. There the Bible says that Satan is released at the end of the thousand years. He gathers together all of the ungodly that were born during the millennium, almost like a magnet of sin and evil. They are gathered unto Satan in one final great war, and the only weapon used in that war is the supernatural fire of God, and it is immediately defeated by the fire and wrath of God, and we end the millennium and enter into our eternal reward. People ask, where does the origin of the word Magog come from? Well, if you have your Bible, I'll let you highlight that. If someone asks you, you might want to be able to identify that. Uh, it's found in the, uh, I believe it's the 10th chapter of Genesis. It is in verse 2, Genesis chapter 10, verse 2. The descendants of Japheth were Gomer, Magog, Madai, Javan, Tubal, Meshech, and Tyrus. So Magog was the, the son of Japheth and the grandson of Noah. So where did the name came, come from? It originally came from Noah's grandson. And uh, we know that Magog's descendants uh, with time settled to the far north of Israel, likely in Europe and northern Asia. So Ezekiel 38 and verse 2, go back to that. Son of man, turn and face Gog of the land of Magog. That's how it got its name in, in biblical terms, the land of Magog. Noah's grandson, Genesis 10 and 2, Noah's grandson, Magog, settled in the land that we now identify as Rosh or Russia. Son of man, turn and face Gog of the land of Magog. Now, what did I teach you earlier? Gog is a leader. Magog is a land. And Russia is the land of Magog. Let's move on to our last question. When will Russia invade Israel? Because when we ask the question, which is the title of this study, what is Russia's role in final Bible prophecy? Russia's role in final Bible prophecy is it will be the key military and whoever the leader is, whether it's Vladimir Putin or intelligence just came out the other day here in the United States, our intelligence revealed whether it's true or confirmed. I haven't heard enough uh, to confirm nor deny, but it was in the news that it has been discovered that Vladimir Putin has a brain tumor. And many are saying that his aggressive behavior and his uh, unintelligent choices, even for his own sake, for example, if he's wanting to take over the Ukraine to destroy the nuclear plant, if that ends up being six times worse than Chernobyl, he, he basically destroys... Only God knows what the geographical mass and the fallout would be that would be uninhabitable for perhaps centuries. 
So many are questioning his aggression, perhaps related to a brain tumor. I don't know. Number one, I'm not a brain surgeon. I'm not a doctor. I'm just telling you it was in the news from U.S. intelligence that they had received report that he may be suffering from a brain tumor. So whether or not Vladimir Putin is Gog of Magog, I don't think an intelligent uh, Bible teacher can put his hand down and dogmatically say, uh, I think that would be uh, unlettered scholarship. So I'm just going to be humble enough to say he may be, maybe not. Uh, he could die. He could be assassinated uh, before the day is over. But whoever it is, we know that Gog is a leader and Magog is the land. Covered that thoroughly. Gog will be the leader, whether it's Vladimir Putin or the next leader or the one after. I can't speculate. All I know is that Magog is Russia and Gog will be the leader that will put together a coalition army, invade Israel out of the north. Now, I'll deal with this and the geography of this in a later study, but just to simplify in answering this third question, when will Russia invade Israel? Uh, Russia, along with Turkey, uh, will lead this invasion from the north into Israel. Iran will join from the east. Uh, along with Iraq, Sudan, and Libya will press in from the south and Germany from the west. Along with these, the Islamic nations, oftentimes called the Stan nations, and I called them the Stan nations uh, because it would represent Afghanistan and Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan and Uzbekistan and Turkmenistan, and uh, now you know why they're oftentimes just simply referred to as the Stan nations. But all of those nations have one thing in common, or perhaps I should say two. They have two things in common. One would be a unified hatred for Israel and Jews. The second would be that they all represent Islamic nations and are Muslim. Uh, let me close by telling you why this is not going to happen now because many people are going to write and ask, and so I need to answer it, because if you're following this Bible study analytically, and, and you have uh, a decent ability to discern the, the roadmap of Bible prophecy, many of you would say, well, are we headed to war with Israel? I will say this, and again, listen carefully, what's going on in Russia right now is not the main story, it's the back story from a Bible perspective. I don't say that in any way to demean the horrific conditions and the multiple millions of innocents that are dealing with Russia's aggression right now. There are about 44 million people in Ukraine right now that are in a living nightmare, and many have been slaughtered. Uh, we seemingly have had a violation of uh, various war treaties and some of the methodologies that have been employed by Putin. Uh, he is definitely, though it is against uh, war uh, law, it is against uh, those laws to attack innocent civilian communities. He has done that. We know that there's a death toll and about 44 million Ukrainian people are living in what they probably feel is hell. And I can't help but say we need to continue to pray for them I am blown away by the courage. I think of one professional boxer. I, if it's a sin, if boxing is a sin, pray for me. I enjoy it. But there's a very famous Ukrainian world champion who's a multimillionaire. He could have taken his private jet and left, but instead suited up and took on arms and has made the statement I will die in the Ukraine if I have to, to fight for the freedom of my homeland. And there are untold heroic stories just like that. It probably doesn't help in the eyes of Putin that the president of Ukraine is Jewish. Some of you may not know that little piece of the puzzle, but the president of Ukraine is Jewish, which would add to Vladimir Putin's hatred for him 
and for wanting to annex that land. He's already done it in Crimea. He's already maneuvered into the Republic of Georgia. He's now clearly trying to annex Ukraine, and he is doing his best to reassemble the Russian Empire, but he'll not immediately move into Israel, and let me answer why. And I'll come back on a specific teaching and deal in depth with this. But number one, the Bible says prophetically that he'll not invade Israel. First of all, three things have to happen according to the Bible. Write it down. Number one, Israel must be present in her land. She is. That prophecy was fulfilled May 14, 1948. And Aliyah, the regathering of Jews from around the world, continues in mass as I speak, Israel must be present in her land, number one, is fulfilled. Number two, Israel must not only be present in her land, she must be prosperous in her land, and that has been fulfilled. So two out of the three prophecies in the Bible that keep Russia with the allied nations from attacking Israel out of the north, two out of the three are totally fulfilled, no debate, absolutely true. But the third is Israel must be at peace in her land. And Israel is not at peace in her land. That's the only piece of the prophetic puzzle that has not been fulfilled before Russia, along with that coalition of armies from that region of the world, come into Israel from the north and attack her. The only one of three is Israel is not at peace in her land. For those of you that have been to Israel... One of the first things that will stand out to you is all of the young people are either wearing military uniforms or carrying weapons or both. I've been to Israel on a few occasions and it's quite striking to see all of their students carrying automatic weapons, ready for war, ready to defend Israel at the drop of a hat. So to say Israel is at peace in our land simply isn't true. When will Israel be at peace? It will be after the rapture of the church. For the Bible says when the Antichrist arises, Daniel chapter 9 and verse 27, he'll go to Jerusalem and he'll sign a peace treaty with Israel, which again is why I believe the strongest academic and biblical argument for the timing of the invasion of Israel is after the rapture of the church. Well, I don't know about you, this is a fascinating subject and obviously it's not intended to be an exhaustive study, but today I wanted you as a student of the Bible from sound biblical scholarship without speculation and without my opinion and without trying to make my own personal narrative to just open the Bible, start in the Bible, stay in the Bible, finish in the Bible, and answer what we've answered today. What is Russia's role in final Bible prophecy? The Russian Empire is being revived. They'll not stop there. She'll then turn her lust towards Israel. She'll amass a coalition armies of people that hate Israel from that region of the world the Islamic nations as well, many other nations will deal with the specifics of that at a later time and invade Israel, but that will not happen. I believe the Bible clearly teaches us until after the rapture of the church. So in conclusion, I think of the words of Jesus in Matthew's gospel in the 24th chapter. Jesus said in the last days, I believe it's in the 6th verse, Matthew 24 verse 6, that in the last days there would be wars and rumors of wars. We are currently watching war and rumor of war, perhaps like nothing since World War II as I speak. Jesus said a clear definitive sign to be ready for His soon return, wars and rumors of wars. The second thing He said in Matthew 7 was pandemics. Did you know that pandemics were prophesied in the Bible as a major sign to live ready? We are currently living, perhaps at the tail end, of the worst pandemic in human history. And by that, I'm not considering death toll alone. I'm telling you that no pandemic in world history 
brought the entire world to its knees, including the major nations of the world. But you have lived long enough to see Matthew 24 and 7, the greatest, most prolific, most crippling pandemic in history. Jesus said, it's a sign of the last days. With all of the things that Jesus prophesied, what did he say we should do? He didn't say freak out. Seeing these things are going to happen, freak out. No, he didn't say freak out. He said, lift up your head. In other words, live ready. Are you living ready to meet the Lord? And if you're not living ready to meet the Lord, that is our main goal at Lost Lamb Association. That is the fire that burns hottest in my belly. I want you to be ready to meet the Lord. I want you to be more than a student of the Bible. I want you to be ready to meet the Lord. And people always ask me, how can I be sure that I'm right with God? You have to do three things to be right with God. Number one, you have to recognize your sin. Number two, you have to repent of your sin. And number three, you must receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. God's only Son died on a cross. He lived a sinless life. He willingly died upon the cross. He rose again proving He was the Son of God. And He promised over 400 times in the Bible we're told that He will return. If you're not living ready for the Lord's soon return, how can you watch what's going on in our world today and gamble with your eternal address and your eternal destiny? Will you pray with me right now, wherever you're at? And when you're done praying with me, I want you to do two things because we're viewing and utilizing various platforms. Go to our website, lostlamb.org, and click on New Beginnings. I have materials there and teachings there for all of you that are coming back to Christ. Number two, go to our YouTube channel and subscribe there. And there's a playlist by the same name, New Beginnings. Before you listen to the other interesting Bible prophecy content, will you listen to all of the teachings on New Beginnings? If you're receiving Christ or you're coming back to Christ, pray with me right now. Just say, Heavenly Father, Today as I was listening to the Bible, you were speaking to me. And I desire to be ready in these last days. You know everything I've ever done. But the Bible says all who call upon your name shall be saved. And so right now, I confess my sin. And I'm willing to repent. I trust in the cross. And in the blood that you shed, wash me and cleanse me and make me ready. For today I receive salvation and I receive Jesus Christ. And I vow this day I will serve the Lord. In Jesus' name, I am no longer the property of sin. I am today a child of God and I'll never be the same. In Jesus' name, amen.